All right. Hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us this evening for um, our the Canny New York City Committee um, is hosting this webinar for workforce development. And on the webinar right now, we have Esther Bigler um, from uh, Cornell, um, Lauren Lewis from Staff Buffalo, um, Chris Lagana from Team Employer, um, Sol should be joining us shortly, and Dan Kaufman Burson from um, the Department of Labor. Hello, everybody. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. And um, so basically what we're going to do is we're, I'm just going to go through some of the, um, make the introductions. Um, and uh, we're going to make the introductions. And I just want to highlight, I, people are just going to say their name, um, where they're from, and just a little bit of uh, information about yourself and, and what your company or what your you know organization does. Um, let me just share my screen. Hold on one second. All right, and all right, can everybody see this? All right, mm -hmm. great, thank you. All right, all right, here you go. And we'll start with Esther. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Esther Bigler and I'm co-chair of the Cannabis Workforce Initiative. And I'm also the Director of Labor and Employment Law Programs at the Cornell ILR School. Let me say a few words about CWI, which is the Cannabis Workforce Initiative. It is a collaboration between Cornell ILR and the Workforce Development Institute, WDI. And our entire goal is to support social equity, diversity, to really make sure that in our own little way, that this new cannabis industry is fair, equitable, and we see that people who have been injured by mass incarceration benefit from this industry and communities are able to generate wealth for themselves and for the future. My piece of CWI as a lawyer, I do the legal piece. And so those will be the things that I'll be able to speak about today. CWI's other partner, uh, WDI, the Workforce Development Institute, their piece is workforce development. And together, I think we bring together the best of both worlds in terms of workforce development and legal knowledge that workers need to have in order to enforce their own rights and what employers need to have so they're successful and they're able to really build good businesses. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. The only other piece well, I'll add, which is really not in my- I think that's the reason Kenny was on that shit. Is that I am also the chair of the New York State Apprenticeship and Training Council. So I have a big interest in workforce development as well. Great. Um, all right, we'll, um, we'll move on to Lauren. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm in Buffalo, New York. So we are preparing for a huge snowstorm apparently that's coming, but there's not a flake that has fallen in the city of Buffalo yet. Um, I am a partner at Staff Buffalo and HR Buffalo. Um, Staff Buffalo does full service recruiting for businesses. So we really focus on direct hire staffing and also talent acquisition um, consulting as well. And then our HR side of our business, HR Buffalo provides um, human resources consulting for small to medium-sized businesses that don't have an internal HR function, or if they do have one, we can help support them through different projects as well. So we really act as that HR person for their company. And um, we've gotten you know, our, our feet wet in the cannabis space. We've worked with a lot of companies to kind of help them identify what their needs are as they're building and growing their organizations from a hiring perspective and from an HR perspective as well, making sure they're meeting you know, all the requirements as an organization that you have to have set in place for having a business and having employees, like your employee handbook, your policies and procedures, and getting all of that squared away. Um, as you continue to grow your business and you want to make sure it's as the best business it can be and having all those key pieces in place will really help it thrive and grow and you know optimize the business so happy to be here today and happy to listen to all of our other panelists as well and chat with everyone about where we're at right now within cannabis in new york state great thank you and chris 
Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks, Vanessa, for having me. Really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Chris Lagana. I am the uh, Chief Growth Officer at Team Ployer. Um, I've been in the cannabis industry for about six years now uh, on the technology side. Um, the last four years, specifically on the payroll, human resources, and benefits side of things. Um, and uh, I've actually onboarded now, I just counted, over 200 companies uh, in all regulated states. So I have a thorough understanding of you know what it's like, um, especially in those early stages. We work with a lot of small businesses, making sure that they're getting um, equipped with their HR and uh, payroll needs. And so I can speak today really on the technology side of things and how important it is to make sure that you are partnering with cannabis specific uh, technology companies, not even just in payroll and HR, but outside of uh, payroll and HR is super important. And I know Vanessa and team at Canny is already working with like a great pool of businesses. So you're already in good hands. Saul, I believe he's still not on yet. Uh, he might be having some technical difficulties, but he was representing the local 338, who, um, as you may know, may or may not know, um, an LPA agreement is required for retail operators um, and or actually in all operators in the industry. So that is a requirement. And and um, so we had him represent um, him for the uh, local 338, but um, hopefully we can maybe get him on later on. Um, and Dan. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Dan Kaufman Burson from the New York State Department of Labor's Seed Unit. Thank you so much to Kenny for, for organizing this webinar and having me. Uh, thanks to my fellow panelists and, and thanks to, to you all for attending. Uh, as a quick overview, the New York State Department of Labor serves job seekers, workers, and businesses throughout New York. Our services are free of charge. Uh, we help New Yorkers find careers they love by connecting them to employment, training, and upskilling opportunities. We support businesses by helping them find qualified workers and keeping them informed about tools and incentives to help their businesses thrive. And we empower and protect workers by ensuring all workers have a safe workplace where they receive a fair wage. Uh, just so you know, we have 95 career centers across the state through which we serve 500,000 job seekers and 30,000 businesses per year on average. The Cannabis Employment and Education Development Team or SEED team uh, works out of DOL Central Office in Albany. Bear with me one second. And we were uh, really created to focus on uh, cannabis specifically as it relates to labor. Uh, overarchingly, we're really working to help build out an equitable and diverse cannabis workforce. You know, we're highlighting opportunities in the emerging adult use market. We're identifying cannabis education programs. And we're most specifically to you all probably, we're helping businesses navigate best practices and labor standards in, uh, labor standards in the emerging industry. Uh, recently, a lot of what we've been doing is going to events like these and providing information about licensing and market rollout, the expected jobs that will come under each license type in cannabis, uh, transferable skills into the industry, and how people can get skilled up with formal education if they're interested. And again, we're also letting businesses know about what NISDAL services are available to them if they may be interested. Uh, all this said, if I can get one piece of information across today, it's to please consider the Department of Labor a resource and partner, whether you're looking to work in cannabis or run a cannabis business. Thanks again for having me. Great, thank you. All right, and um, just as a preface for everybody um, that's attending, if you guys would like to have any questions, please, um, as we're going through the program, please um, put it in the Q&A on the chat, and then we'll answer all the questions at the end of the, um, the webinar. Um, right now, we're going to start going through um, some of the moderated questions and, and questions that we came up with in advance. Um, so uh, the first one is going to be about training. Um, so... Like I said before, every, everybody can jump in wherever they think um, it, you know it's appropriate. Um, so if someone missed something, you know it's 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 all good to ha hear from everybody because everybody has experience in all these areas. I think a little bit. So um, so we're gonna start with training. Um, 
So what are your thoughts on the worker for certification program that is required by the OCM? So I'd like to see what your thoughts are. Since the regulations did come out last week that um, there, there needs to be a required certification program for all um, employees and as a retail operator coming into the space, all they were, um, I just wanted to see what, um, what are your thoughts on that and how do you think that's going to um, uh, work and, and, and um, what kind of programs are going to be out there. Yeah, I, I, I can start with this. So it's a great question. Um, it's pretty standard in a lot of the regulated states, Missouri, for example, California, um, to have certification programs. And, you know, it's, it's also pretty standard in other industries as well. Uh, service industry, you know, uh, bartenders, need to take various courses every year uh, in order to uh, to to stay employed. And then training is important. It sets a standard. Um, and I think companies should be doing ongoing training. And that's both on the product side, but also I think on, you know, various um, state required uh, courses as well. Okay. So we know that OCM has started its own training program. The Office of Cannabis Management has started its own uh, mentoring program for cultivation and processing licenses. And so they are in the process of reading through all of the applications and deciding who's going to be in the first group in the program. And I think that's really important, I think, because that will begin to set the standard of what OCM will be looking for in terms of training. So CWI, we do training, we have a whole training program and we will in fact be doing part of the training for OCM. So I'll get a bird's eye view of what exactly OCM wants and what OCM is requiring of people. We will be doing the labor and employment law pieces and there'll be pieces about growing, there'll be pieces about employment relations, there'll be HR pieces as well. So it looks like it's a comprehensive program that they are putting together. Um, in terms of training and education, it seems to me we have to divide things into two pieces. One is the skill training that's very, very important that employers should be doing for themselves as well as to meet the certification requirements. And then there's the training, which we talk about as soft skills, but is just as important. Talking about, especially if we're talking about a dispensary, for example, you need to have good customer service skills. You need to have conflict resolution skills. Uh, you need to be able to deal with difficult customers. So all of those are soft skills that are necessary. In addition, sometimes you wanna to go to an outside vendor, for example, to prevent sexual harassment. There's a requirement that employers in this state do sexual harassment training. That would be an outside vendor that you would go to. So there are a number of different places where an employer can turn for the kind of education uh, that's gonna be required in this industry. Okay. Is there any type of, let's say, um, I guess, like a list of like, how, what would be the best way in terms of um, connecting with someone that would understand or like a company, is there companies that do that where they list out, for example, um, all the training that you would be required by law or, and, and more and then some to, to access this kind of like, so that we, like as operator, like a new operator, we know, okay, I need to get this, this is like a checklist. So how would they know to do that? Because I think that as a, as a lot of these people are going to be new operators, they don't even know where to find that as a resource. So, the, so what I can say is that on the Department of Labor website, there is some great information for business owners to stay in compliance with labor law, whether it's labor standards, wage with, you know, uh, minimum wage information, really a lot of great compliance help on the website. There's no definitive cannabis list, I can tell you, of, of training providers. One thing we are tracking at, on the seed team is more accredited institutional education. Um, but uh, one thing that we are, are working on is how to track and what a threshold would be for uh, tracking training providers, right? And helping people understand specifically in cannabis where they can look uh, and what training they might need uh, specifically for their business. The other thing that we, you know, you can recommend is we're going to have to see how some of this shakes out with OCM regulations. 
uh, in their full package regulations, they may, you know, it remains to be seen, but they may actually dictate what specific trainings uh, employers or license holders need to provide uh, or need to make available for their employees. So that might shake out as well. Yep. Also, WDI has a, a website which you can go to the website and find a number of different training providers so that you can see what is available. But you've now given me an idea, Vanessa, mm -hmm. of the kind of thing we should, I should probably have a student begin working on to put together a list of all of the kinds of training. OSHA 30, OSHA 30 training, which is required. Sexual harassment training, which is required. Mm -hmm. So that a number of the different requirements can be in one place. We can't recommend a training provider, but we can certainly make a list available to uh, prospective uh, dispensary owners. Yeah, which is definitely helpful for, and, and, you know, as a new operator, they don't know. I mean, and a lot of these, uh, a lot of card applicants and a lot of people may not have, um, you know, even operated in cannabis or have operated a business at all. So, and, you know, and candy is comprised of a lot of small to mid-sized businesses, so they don't have a clue. So I think having a consolidated checklist of what kind of training to be compliant would be really helpful. Um, and as far as anyone knows, um, I know uh, since the regulations did come out last week, does anybody have that, has anybody heard of any certification programs that are approved by OCM yet at this point? No. <laughs> no, what, what I do know is that on the, the medical side, which is right, probably outside the purview of, of this group here, but on the medical side, there are approved training providers for the required trainings for practitioners that certified, cert, certify medical patients, as well as the pharmacists that need to be on staff at those medical dispensaries. Um, I guess the reason really I mention it besides a list of, of potential providers is, you know, maybe OCM will release similar information on the adult use side, right? If they've done it, if it's been done on the medical side, there's potential for it to be done on the, the adult use side as well, but we'll have to see. Another thing, Vanessa, is that many of the community colleges, the SUNY community colleges, as well as colleges as part of CUNY, are putting together their own training program. So an so people will be able to, for example, get an associate degree with an emphasis on cannabis. And so that is happening right now. Uh, SUNY actually put money to several of the different schools, gave money to several of the different SUNY campuses to develop training programs. So that's going to be another place that uh, newcomers coming into to this industry will be able to go for training, whether we're talking about cultivation or we're talking about processing or dispensary operations. Um, I think there's a lot of ramping up that's happening right now. And I would certainly suggest people take a look at the SUNY and the CUNY schools as well. And if I could just add, thank you for mentioning that, Esther. Actually on the Department of Labor, we do have a cannabis workforce development specific, a website specific for cannabis. And we're tracking exactly those programs. We have SUNY and CUNY programs uh, with their specific targeted programs for cannabis, as well as private institutions. Um, so that's a, a resource available to, especially job seekers, if they're interested in, in finding formal education. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question is, how often should we train or retrain our staff for after the initial program? What does that look like? And I know, obviously, um, for the regulations, we know that you have to onboard them within 30 days for the initial training. Um, so what does it look like for retraining them in the future? And how how often do you feel that we should do that? <laughs> hey, everyone. Uh, this is Saul with Local V38. I'm sorry I was a few minutes late. Life got in the way. Uh, so apologize for that. Um, but uh, for the question that Vanessa just posed, you know, from a labor point, I think that it's important that employees get retrained at least once a year. Uh, because even though, you know, the experience and they know what they're supposed to do, what tends to happen is over time, they start to find shortcuts to do things or they forget how they were used to do them because everybody starts to do them differently. And then what I've seen is, you know, uh, something happens, uh, especially in an industry as regulated as cannabis, and the company gets in trouble, and then uh, the one that you know takes the brunt of it is the employee, uh, even though it was management and lack of training that has allowed for that you know uh, shortcut to become a, a practice. So I think that, and I always encourage uh, 
the companies that I deal with now to provide training at least yearly. Um, so those are my two cents on that. Great, right, thank you. Sure. Um, and then um, lastly, can we train in-house or is it recommended to outsource it? So if we develop an initial program, uh, so for example, if we you know met with someone and, and kind of created a training manual and stuff like that, um, and is it something that the employer should be uh, implementing themselves or is it something that you anybody suggests to outsource to a third-party vendor to kind of um, you know implement it being that they can maybe update some of the training regulations Relations and things like that uh, on an ongoing basis? I think it depends on which training we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, if we're looking at training for customer service skills, sexual harassment prevention, uh, diversity training, uh, the kinds of things that need to be done to meet state requirements, um, that should be outsourced because it is really very highly technical, legal, and you wanna make sure that you're getting the very best training. Certainly if there are new regulations that, that are issued by OCM, you're going to want someone who is really specialized in that area to come in to do regulation training once a year. However, if we're talking about the basic skills and keeping people's skills up to date, employers know what they need and they have their way of doing it. And so for that kind of training, I would think that that could be done in-house. I'm interested to hear what my colleagues have to say about that. Um, but I am a big believer in, frankly, in apprenticeship training. We don't have that in this industry at the moment. And so it seems to me the best possibility there would be employer training. And if if the employees are represented by, for example, 338, there can be joint training that can be put together by the union and the employer, which is, of course, very much the apprenticeship model often in this state. Yeah, I agree with Asta. I think there's definitely certain trainings that you should outsource, um, especially as someone who's you know, a business owner. You're, a lot of times you're focused on so much on the day-to-day -day and moving your business forward and growing your business and taking care of your employees and making sure they're doing what they're supposed to do. And there's so many different things going on. If you have a, a partner, like Asta mentioned, for those like particular trainings that we need to do at the state level, especially in New York State, there's a lot of different policies, procedures we have to maintain, sexual harassment training. You know, having a partner that can kind of keep you on track and reminding you that you have to do these trainings as well is super important. And it's a lot as a business owner to keep track of all the things that you have to get done. So I think I always tell people like surround yourself with great partners that can help you with those other aspects of your business and kind of help telling you what you're supposed to do and when you're supposed to do it and keeping you on track. So you can really focus on your business and you can focus on the, the specialty of your business and what you do day in and day out. And those trainings could probably be done in house. If there's someone else who's a specialist that maybe outside of the business, you can lean on for those trainings as well. Do it. Like, Surround yourself with as many people and specialists as possible that can help you continue to move your business forward and make sure your employees are trained appropriately from all aspects. Right. And I, I would I would piggyback off uh, Lauren's point too on the technology piece, you know, with HR technology, I would make sure that you're communicating all of those training courses through your uh, HR technology, uh, through HR platform. A lot of cannabis specific ones like Team Employer, and there's a few others out there. Um, actually, have integrations into various trainings, but then also, you know, you'll see when employees are up for retraining. Um, you don't want to be a company like, you know, I, I think of uh, an instance with a company in Nevada who um, had employees that were working that their badges were expired. Now, had they just had technology that showed all their employees with their badge dates and when those employees needed to be um, going to uh, get their badge renewed, they wouldn't have had that problem and they wouldn't have had to pay a $250,000 fine per employee um, that was working on badge. So it's, it's, it's the same kind of concept with the training, um, housing it in the HR platform. And I think Lauren can attest to is super important. So you can, you know, just, you can see which employees have taken the courses, which ones haven't and able to communicate to those who haven't to make sure that they, you know, uh, do the fulfillment of the trainings. Um, 
before uh, any given date. Great, thank you. So we're moving on to employer best practices. Um, and the first question is, is there any way to prevent outsiders from taking your cannabis jobs? <laughs> Probably. Um, um, yeah, so th that was one of the bigger questions um, just because of uh, the multi-state operators coming in and stuff like that and people, in, you know, influx of people coming in and moving here to work in cannabis. What I could, I could at least start off is one thing we're doing you know, as we go around the state and, and help to people understand what's coming is we're definitely promoting the fact that you don't necessarily need experience in cannabis to get into the cannabis industry, right? People want to have transferable skills that they have currently that they've been doing at jobs for years that are directly relatable to working in cannabis. Um, and for job seekers, starting to think about like a resume expressing your interest in cannabis, cover letters expressing your interest in cannabis, expanding your person, you know, your your professional network, learning as much as you can about the language of cannabis through reading the regulations and the guidelines, doing whatever you can to really educate yourself so you can really speak to the language of regulated cannabis um, would just set you apart, I think, uh, uh, for and set you off, you know, mark, be able to market yourself really for, for positions in cannabis. Another thing you can do is really keep your finger on the pulse of job postings, right? And companies that are getting licenses so that you can potentially contact them early, right? And get uh, potential jobs before they kind of hit the Indeeds or even uh, DOL's job zone, right? Uh, as you expand your network, you never know what job might pop up that's not posted or was going to be posted that you can grab. Um, and then maybe from the employer side, uh, things that people can do is to, to help prevent this potentially is to really do targeting recruitment in their particular area, right? Uh, NISDAL can certainly help with that. We provide free recruitment assistance uh, for businesses. We can do tailored uh, recruitment events. We actually did one specifically for cannabis in Rochester in September, where we had about almost 300 people, job seekers come through and talk directly with seven cannabis businesses that were hiring immediately or soon after in the area. So that's one thing that businesses can do to really target hiring people in their, their local area specifically. Right. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> how can we protect the employee versus the employer? So that might be a question for Saul or <laughs> something, um, you know, uh, how how the protection against uh, for, you know, so Saul, do you want to take that? Yes, um, I was just going to say, can you re repeat the entire question again? So oh, can get how can we protect the employee versus employer? So like, and, and Phil, if you wanted mm -hmm. to expand on that, because I know that was a question that you had. <laughs> Go ahead, we put it in. I mean, I can only speak from a labor standpoint, right? And um, I mean, local theory, we try to navigate that space of what it is to be a union and to be there for the worker. But at the same time, we try not to create an antagonistic relationship between worker and employer because that doesn't benefit anybody, right? If nobody wants to go to work because they hate their employer and the employer hates their members, then it's not a fun place for nobody. So, uh, you know, we are able to navigate and create partnerships uh, with these employers just to make them see that everything, you know, there is always a middle point in everything. Um, and a few times that we don't agree, you know, I think that with employers that we've been dealing a longer time, they've come to understand that nothing is personal whenever we have to take these arbitration is just because the, the way I put it, uh, let's let a third party uh, be the, the, the last factor, uh, for example, in determination. Right, that protects the employer and the union in the sense that if it's a third party that makes a decision ultimately, as if somebody was somebody just or not, you know, uh, then it takes the ownership off of the employer, off of the union, because it was a third party that made that decision. Um, but we always try to partner with with employers, you know, whenever there's a policy that they're going to roll out, we do have the ability to look at the policy beforehand if it's going to affect the working conditions of the employee. So in, so in that manner, we're able to tweak it to make sure that it doesn't conflict with anything in the CBA. And at the same time, once the policy is good to go, we also not helping the rollout because we don't, uh, you know, we don't enforce policy. But when we visit the members, we say, hey, listen, this policy, you know, makes sense. It's reasonable. And, you know, we're going to ask you to make sure that to protect the business and, you know, make sure that you stay within those guidelines. So, I mean, we, we're always trying to navigate that employer-employee uh, relationship, which is not easy all the time. Of course. Yeah, yeah so and I, I think, think... Oh, go ahead, Lauren. I'll, I'll go after you, Lauren. Okay. <laughs> um, 
you know, as an employer, it's important you have like things written out. So you have to have like your employee handbook where you state all your policies, your procedures for the organization. Um, and how you build out your handbook is not just the policies and procedures that you want to have or you think you should have. You really have to incorporate, you know, what you have to offer your employees from the state side as well, like the state regulations, whether it's New York state paid sick leave, paid family leave, you know, there's different policies around time, paid time off, their working hours, how much you, how you pay them versus their standard work hours and overtime exempt versus non-exempt employees. So you really kind of have to have all that laid out and have it in an employee handbook. So it's clear for your employees as well. So they know what to expect from you and what their rights are from a policies perspective. Um, and what they they have access to as well in an organization. So I really think like having things ironed out, laid out clearly for your employees helps to eliminate some of the confusion out there about like what their rights are as an employee. And then you can always go back to that. If, something, if an issue comes up, well, you can go back to your handbook and say, well, this is the policy, this is here. And you always have to have your employees read the handbook um, when they start. And I put read it in quotes because, you know, as employers, we give them the handbook and we're not necessarily quizzing them on every section of it. We expect them to read it or at least save it so that they know what their rights are and what the policies are at your organization, but have them sign off on it. So, you know, okay, like they were given this, they signed off that they agree to all the policies and procedures in the handbook. And that kind of covers your bases as an employer as well. Yeah. So what is, what does everybody uh, want to... at the workplace? They want a fair and equitable workplace where right. they're respected and they have voice. So that's what everybody wants. And when you hire somebody, you wanna keep them because it costs a lot of money to train someone and then have them leave. So at first right. blush, what it seems to me, we need to not think about, about employer versus employee. There is a set of laws um, and regulations which every employer in the state of New York and the United States has to follow. So there are wage and hour laws that need to be followed. Um, Lauren already mentioned the fact that there is paid family leave in this state, whereas the federal government, it's Family Medical Leave Act, but you don't get paid. We have paid sick leave in this state, which we don't have in, in other states. Um, in addition, we have a very robust EEO laws in terms of not discriminating. And we have many more protected classes in this state than there are in the federal government, for example. And for dispensary owners, just as a, as a quick to move just a second away from employees, your people who come into your store, you are a public accommodation. And so not discriminating in somebody for race, sex, national origin, religion, sexual orientation, gender, disability, age, um, marital status, veteran status. That's the way you have to treat not only your employees and not discriminating against them, but also people who come into your store. So these laws are all there in a way to make a fair and equitable workplace. And they apply across the board. Um, and the, the last piece I'll say about that, which I think is really important is making sure that employers as well as employees understand the rules about sexual harassment and, and a hostile work environment, because those are the two things that will cause you tremendous difficulty in terms of running a successful business. One other piece, the um, wage law in New York State, the minimum wage law is going up for places outside of New York City um, to, uh, I think it's fourteen dollars and ten cents. It goes into effect if you have an if you're working now on December thirty first, and so starting not January one, December thirty first. So on that date, you have to start paying the new rate. New York City and the environs, we are still at fifteen dollars an hour, and that hasn't gone up. So just as a wage an hour can also be something which can really cause you a tremendous problem if you're, if you're not keeping good records and you're not paying time and a half when you're supposed to pay it. So as a paid political announcement, 
the CWI, the work, the Cannabis Workforce Initiative, we have a whole program of education for all of these things, for both employers and employees. And much of this information will be found on our CWI.org website to help employers be the best employers they could possibly be and to make sure employees know that they have rights. If you don't know you have a right, you can't enforce that right. Right. Well, uh, leading on to the next question would be, are there both barriers and opportunities regarding hiring workers impacted by the war on drugs? So would that be categorized as discrimination or non, I mean, or non-discrimination if you were, you know, trying to focus on people who were uh, criminalized for, for, you know, having a drug offense uh, previously? Um, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, in the New York State Human Rights Law and New York City Human Rights Law, discriminating against someone because they have a criminal record, that's a protected class. So you can't discriminate against someone who has a criminal record. And from my experience in working with people who've been involved in the criminal legal system, they make great employees. Mm -hmm. So um, it is if you know how to interview and you know how to pick good employees, picking someone who's been involved in the criminal legal system, you'll get a good employee. And, and the issue is never picking one over the other. It's picking the best person and not discriminating against someone who has a criminal record. Yeah, I would, I would just add that you know the, there's a, a very large social and economic equity focus of the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act, and hiring people that were specifically disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition would go directly towards achieving those goals. And there is a portion in, in the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act that effectively you know, dictates that the board, it's not so much a dictate, dictate as you know, mentioning that the, the Cannabis Control Board is, is, is going to be looking to uh, diversifying the workforce, right, and, and effectively uh, helping social and economic equity applicants find employment in, in the cannabis industry. So it would be a great opportunity to really further those goals by people hiring folks from those, in, those impacted areas and uh, impacted experiences. And they're going to be writing a really uh, a manual. OCM is going to be putting out a manual on how they're going to be looking at social equity. And whether you're, a so, whether you're a social equity entrepreneur and whether you are providing social equity opportunities. And so my guess is that this is employment is going to be a big piece of that, Dan. Great. Thank you. Um, and sorry. The other, the next question, I'm, I might skip around over here a little bit just because of timing and stuff like that. Um, what, um, um, do we need, uh, what will be the available roles at the start of this market and in what parts of the sector? What does this look like as the industry evolves between year two to four? So how do you guys think that that's going to be in the beginning? Um, what roles are going to be need to be filled uh, as opposed to further down the line? I can start. I hate to be, uh, I don't mean to talk on, okay. respond yeah, to all the questions. Okay. I can certainly start. I, I mean, I think it's it ultimately... I don't want to sound like a broken record here either, but it's going to depend, right, on the rollout of licensing from the Office of Cannabis Management. You know, what we've seen in the conditional space in what year are we in, 2022, it's been a blur, uh, is, you know, they've kind of followed the seed to sale life cycle, right? They started with granting conditional cultivation licenses and, and processor licenses to hemp operators. Uh, and then they're clearly, it seems to be moving on to dispensary licensing while making sure that they have some testing um, testing laboratories in line to, to, to kind of complete the supply chain. Um, I think it's good, we're gonna have to see what comes out in 2023 in terms of whether they follow a similar format where they kind of follow the, the uh, supply chain in how they grant licenses or they just do them all in one big tranche. Um, and it's also gonna depend on how quickly businesses can get up and operate, right? How quickly can they capitalize, uh, whether they have to do a funding round or try to shore up you know, conventional uh, lending, which we know is really difficult in the cannabis industry. So I think all those things are going to effectively have to play out before we kind of see what roles are going to be available, um, really just based on the licensing. So I know that's a, a big non-answer, but kind of how I see it playing out in terms of the, the, uh, the jobs available. What we know now also, I'll add, is there are um, existing operators uh, that are currently hiring across the really the supply chain. You know, medical operators continue to hire across the state. Uh, there are conditional cultivators. I checked before this event that continue to hire 
Um, there are um, ancillary businesses that are ramping up. So that's a big important piece that maybe we haven't touched on is all these ancillary businesses and the economic impact on service providers, right? Um, for just lack of a better term, you know, businesses that service cannabis businesses. Um, I, I see that they continue to hire across the state, really ramping up their hiring in anticipation of the market. And I'm guessing that'll continue in 2023 as we see what the licensing rollout will look like on a grander scale. Yeah, for sure. All right, on to the next section. Well, uh, sorry, I was going to add because I'm real quick. And kind of on the ancillary businesses as well, you know, as these businesses can grow and develop, you're going to have those positions as well, those professional jobs, a lot of times that maybe you have in other, sec you know, other, every other industry, your accounting positions at your company, your operations people, your administrative, your customer service, your, you know, HR, legal team, sales, marketing. Like those, those roles are going to be part of these companies as they continue to grow as well. Yes, of course, the growers and processors are kind of the first one. That's where the business starts. But then as they grow and need more people and their businesses grow, their operations of grow, they're going to have all those other types of businesses or excuse me, types of positions as well. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of opportunity I think, for people who want to get into the space and use their transferable skills to go from say manufacturing into the cannabis space as well. So you're going to have a lot of crossover. And I see a lot of those jobs starting to form as well with the businesses, the cannabis businesses in New York State as they grow. Yeah. And um, so leading to our next question, when should an operator start looking to hire staff, upper management and or down to the sales bug tenders? At what point should we start looking for, for these positions um, to, to uh, you know, and then to be operational? I don't think it's ever too early to start. I mean, I think as business owners, you you want great people around you. You want great people who are dedicated to your company, to your mission, to helping you grow your business, whatever it might be within the cannabis space. Um, I think the key is to really just look for people that have the transferable skills who thrive more in a, a, a small business that's growing, who can wear multiple hats and really help you with whatever aspect of the business you might need that day. Um, of course, as a cannabis business is starting, you probably want people who have the cannabis knowledge but around growing and processing. Um, but having some of those other key people that really help you with your business and wear multiple hats can be really key. So I think just starting to find the right people that are going to be a good fit for you, your business, and the culture of your business and see kind of that long-term vision with you. Um, and treat it like another business, not just wanting to get into cannabis because it's cannabis, like see the opportunity there, but it still is a business. It's still an industry within, within New York state now that really has a lot of potential. So I think you need the, the business savvy, savvy people in part of the organization as well. So I don't think it ever to really start identifying maybe some people that could be a good fit for your business. Right. And so not necessarily having, uh, looking for people that even have any, any cannabis experience, but like for like good sales, bud tender, it could mm -hmm. be just a salesperson that's really good at sales, but if they're a good salesperson, they can sell anything and they can learn yeah. about cannabis. So the key is right. is just having someone that has marketable skills that can translate over to cannabis. Mm -hmm. so, um, and then, um, when building your team, how does an operator know which positions are needed and which are not, um, you know, which, what are the core positions needed for a small operator, uh, versus a big operator? Uh, so I think a lot of people are hesitant to hire so many outs, you know, so many, like, um, you know, people who are, you know, they'll fill in all these positions, but then they'll cost too much thinking that they need it, but then they actually don't. So what are, what, what positions do you think are core positions for a small operator, let's say uh, in retail, because that's where we're on right now um, and with the regulations having been released. Um, so for example, anybody, uh, Lauren, do you have a <laughs> idea? <laughs> I think, you know, again, I think it kind of varies like business to business. Um, you got to think closest to the dollar too. So mm -hmm. what people in your business are going to help you bring in revenue? And that's kind of who, that's, I think, who you should start thinking about, like how you, where you start looking to hire, like which staff is needed, which staff is going to help you not only build the business, but help you bring in revenue and do your sales as well. Um, I don't think, I think you can hire maybe a, just a couple of people, the few different specialties that can, again, maybe crossover jobs. So and the thing with cannabis, I don't think it's necessarily about job titles either. Like 
you got to find people that don't care about a title, but just want to be there to help and can do the job and help you kind of build out your business that way. Um, so I think that's kind of what you need to do in trying to find the positions that are needed. It's going to be as you grow, honestly, trying to find, okay, what do I need now? Yeah. What can I, what can I outsource to? Like, what can I hire yeah. consultants for certain jobs, you know, to kind of maybe save someone, you're not paying someone a full-time salary mm-hmm. and do it that way too, until you can bring on someone full-time. I, I would fullheartedly agree, work with, you know, um, with companies like Lawrence for HR, hire a CPA instead of a full-time accountant. And then, you know, when it makes sense to bring somebody in full-time, you bring them in full-time. I always say start small. Um, I think your team will value you more. Um, you know, nobody wants to be, you know, everyone's, everyone's really there to make money too, you know, so you don't want to make sure you're not over hiring bud tenders and they're not getting enough hours. Um, and then that can just lead to, you know, a whole bunch of problems. And so I would start small and then you can kind of see where you need to pull the lever and where you need to start hiring more employees. And I would also look into like previous experience, like, you know, an inventory manager is an inventory manager. They know how to do inventory, right? So they're going to pick up cannabis inventory. You know, there might be obviously a bit of a learning curve, but they'll pick it up pretty quickly if they're good at inventory management and other, you know other areas of business. All right, thanks. All right, so on to the, the union. <laughs> so Saul, um, so if you can explain, um, obviously um, prior to the MRTA law is to have an LPA agreement um, with a local union um, and that's required for all cannabis operators, whether they're cultivators, processors, wh- whoever has Micro a business. Anything, Micro- yep. <laughs> so um, just to explain briefly, a lot of people should know what an LP is, but um, just what is sure. an LP? <laughs> yeah, so first is, I want to say that it's not just with a local union, it has to be a bona fide union. There's a difference, right? Because anybody can create a local union that is not bona fide uh, and that won't, won't be enough, right? Um, so that's part one. But yeah, so, you know, once... Um, there is a union. I just want to put out there in New York State, we are that, that union because we've been doing this work for the last decade and we've been putting all the legwork in since the Compassionate Care Act. And, and we were actually the ones that brought to, you know, to, um, to the legislators the fact that we needed to have an LPA piece in the licensing. And we did the same thing with the MRTA. We, you know, um, we, we were very involved in the legislative process out there. So what happened was um, an LPA is basically a neutrality agreement. And in that we are just the employer promises, you know, that they're going to be neutral uh, whenever the union comes and speaks to the workers. And in turn, the union promises to keep the labor peace. In other words, we won't picket them or strike them and, and all that stuff. But the labor peace agreement that we have here has even a little bit more, you know, besides the access you know, it also has even things like uh, taking, uh, going to arbitration if we can reach an agreement at some point. But a labor peace agreement uh, does not mean that the employer becomes union automatically. A lot of uh, small employers think that. Uh, I know that lately we've been signing labor peace agreements left and right because of the window that's closing, especially for the conditional cultivators. Uh, I think it closes on Monday. So we've been getting a lot of those uh, over the last week. But it does not mean that you become union union automatically. We did not take the democratic process away from the worker, right? Uh, we still have to go speak to the workers. The workers have to make a decision if they choose to join local P38 or any other bonus union for that matter. Um, you know, it just makes it a lot easier for the worker in the sense that they don't have the fears that they normally have when there's union organizing, such as what we see right now, right? I mean, for those of us that are aware today, Starbucks workers are on strike. Uh, Amazon workers have been fighting for the last couple of years, you know, so the labor peace agreement in my eyes or in our eyes takes away uh, that worry from the employee. It just really gives them the ability to freely make a decision because they're like, okay, my management team just let the union rep walk in. He's sitting in my break room and he's going to tell me what the union does. So it must be okay for me to hear them out. And then I can make a, you know, a free choice. Uh, to join and not join. Uh, and up until now, it's been very successful. Uh, we've organized nine of the 10 uh, medical cannabis companies that operate in New York State. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's pretty much what a labor peace agreement is and is not. Mm-hmm. In a nutshell. What, 
Great, thank you. Um, and what at what time during our business development do we need to secure an LPA? So um, is it yep. something that they you guys will be in for, or as a union, uh, will you be enforcing beforehand, before they're operational or after? Like at what point? No, definitely not. Yeah. N not before, because I mean, we always give companies, you know, some time to get on their feet, right? Uh, because I mean, with everything that we just mentioned right now, or especially over like, the last 10 minutes, like when do you hire, you know, how much people do you hire? So we need to let companies kind of figure that piece out, right? Um, and obviously, you know, as a union, we're, we're also gonna, you know, make sure that the company is viable, right? Because if this is like a mom and pop smoke shop, right, that has three employees, I don't know if we're gonna go organize them, right? Because I mean, how much can a small operation play that really handle? I mean, our job has been to really uh, uplift the industry standard and we're really proud of the standard that we've set already in New York State. It's a lot higher than the standard in any other state right now uh, when it comes down to, to cannabis and we're only in the medicinal part. Uh, we plan on doing the same thing for the adult use. Um, so yes, a company has to sign the LPA uh, when they uh, go take their uh, licensing application to the OCM. We also provide to them a cover letter uh, so that they can hand it into the OCM saying that they lived up to that requirement piece. And then the OPA is active for two full years after that. So that should give an employer enough time to get on, on their feet. And then at that point, you know, we'll start to look at, you know, who's actually functioning, who has X amount of employees. And I don't want to give a number because we haven't made a decision as to what's too small, or what's too big, well, you know, um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, uh, does that uh, answer the question, I think? Yeah, definitely. Right, awesome. And one of the questions that someone also asked was, um, can they get an L LOI with the local 384, the application itself? And right, so an LOI I'm taking is a letter of intent. Yes. <laughs> so there is no letter of intent for the uh, LPA. I mean, the LPA itself is just a page and a half. Yeah. And the cover letter is just a paragraph. So uh, is that well? Is, no is, is that something that they would do um, as an LPA it, for their application, for example? Yes, okay. that's co correct. So whenever they want to fill out the application and hand it into the OCM, uh, they have to have the LPA already signed. Right. Okay. Yeah, that that's correct. Um, I just want to add because I keep getting asked this question as well. So sure. Which is, yeah. if you're signing an LPA, does that mean you've signed a collective bargaining agreement? And the answer is no. A collective bargaining agreement is a separate agreement which is negotiated between the union um, and the employer after the employees choose to be represented by the union and the union and the employer sit down and negotiate a contract. And so right. the LPA is just what Saul said it is. It's just that the employer agrees to remain neutral. You've not signed a collective bargaining agreement yet. And no. I keep getting asked that question over and over again. And I thought it was important yeah. to make that clear. No, and Esther, thank you for, you know, kind of like rehashing that because I did think I mentioned that, but let me be clear for you. I think I said earlier, signing an LPA does not mean that you automatically become a union. But yes, let me be extra clear. Um, we never take away the choice of the employees. Mm -hmm. So signing an LPA could never be a, a CBA or, or the bargaining agreement because that would be taking away the choice of the employees. The employees have to sell heroes out, have to, you know, choose to join us. And at that point, we would then be able to engage the uh, company in negotiation and bargaining on their behalf. So thank you, Esther, again. Thank you, Esther and Saul. Um, sure. I think, uh, so we, um, as far as um, this is pretty much because we're pretty much up on the hour almost. Um, one last question that I did have um, was um, as far as the technology and HR and, and things like that, are there any other um, like systems or programs? I think this is probably for Chris. Um, I know that you're part of the team player, but um, how at what size do you suggest having a a like a program or a tech program to have for HR? Um, that was one of the questions that just came up. Um, you know what? You know at what size is it? There's is there a minimum size or is it something that is you know and and how can a cannabis specific HR program help um, an operator? That's a great question. Um, I don't think that there's a business too small for HR um, and payroll technology. I would avoid um, companies like ADP, 
even uh, paychecks, for example, while they're in cannabis, they're brand new into cannabis and they don't necessarily have the integrations and the compliance piece um, that is really important for cannabis. Um, and I would also look into, if you, you could look into the PEO model, um, which is a whole separate conversation, um, or you can even work with, you know, companies like Lauren's company, you know, and outsource your HR, especially if you're small. Um, there's so many moving pieces with HR, uh, and small companies necessarily don't have the time. And then when you grow and you're big enough to bring an in-house HR person in, um, you know, I would suggest doing that. And there's a lot of options out there. There's actually more, um, than, uh, than people seem to believe, um, you know, with, with HR and payroll, uh, but how I would is, just go Yeah. One question is how is it different then from a regular industry? So it's, it's, it's the way that the money's moved, right? So traditional payroll companies like ADP are, 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 you know, holding their money in, you know, federal insured, you know, holding bank accounts, for example, right? So it's not compliant, right? So that's why you want to make sure that you're working with cannabis specific companies. You want to also make sure that they're putting that you're a cannabis company on your contract. Um, there's a lot of companies out there that uh, will say that they're in cannabis and then they're not. And then the next thing you know, you get a notification that you are getting dropped from your payroll provider. And then what are you going to do? You know, you have you have six weeks to get onboarded to, you know, a new company, um, sometimes less, sometimes four weeks. You know, we, there was a time when ADP, you know, did a whole bunch of drops and they gave companies, you know, two to four weeks. And if you're a large company, I mean, that is a big, uh, a big job to get onboarded into a new system. So you want to just make sure from the beginning that you're working with the right vendors and partners. Yeah. I wanted to uh, actually add to what you know uh, my colleague just said. Uh, it's totally true. You're not too small, and I want to talk a little bit about like a lot of the legacy people that are coming over, or even you know small farms that have not really dealt with this. Right, um, a lot of them are not aware of all the compliance things that we already spoke about. You know, sexual harassment training and all the other things, but also they're not aware of how to do, deal with taxes and and all these other pieces. And it's going to be a headache for them. So I would definitely encourage them, doesn't matter how small you are, even if you only have three employees, you know, I may not come organizing you yet, but definitely get a, a, uh, uh, the HR software that you need to make sure that you're always in compliance. Uh, because I've uh, heard of those stories. Actually, we've been doing this for a while. I know companies myself that would drop from ADP like this. They were giving, you know, two to four weeks and they were done. They've been dropped from other platforms uh, once they they found out that they were cannabis companies because they get scared. They're like, oh my God, can't commingle our funds. And they drop them like a, hot, yeah, <laughs> like a bad habit. So yeah, I would definitely say, because I mean, legacy operators and small farmers maybe never have this level of being under a microscope that they will have being in the cannabis space. So it's important that they protect themselves by having the proper HR company and the proper payroll company, et cetera. Yeah. Right. And lastly, to add, you know, offer benefits, offer 401k, offer those incentives, right? Um, it helps attract and retain employees. Right. Thank you, everybody. Um, so we're just coming up on the hour and I appreciate everyone's participation on this evening. Um, and I did, um, I will be sending out the contact information for everybody, just in case anybody had any follow-up question. It was on the last slide over there, but I appreciate your time and have a good evening. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks. you.